A story about a virus that wipes out anyone it comes into contact with. Gee, I wonder what the comments are going to draw a correlation to. A characteristic of all crises is their predictability in retrospect. They seem to have a certain inevitability. They seem predestined. But a crisis is made by men who enter into the crisis with their own prejudices, propensities, and predispositions. A crisis is the sum of intuition and blind spots, a blend of facts noted and facts ignored. Human intelligence was more trouble than it was worth. It was more destructive than creative, more confusing than revealing, more discouraging than satisfying, and more spiteful than charitable. This is why humans under stress are fools, and they fool themselves. But perhaps the fact that we bleed to death is what makes us human. Scientific research was much like prospecting. You went out and you hunted, you armed with your maps and your instruments, but in the end your preparations didn't matter, or even your intuition. You needed your luck, and whatever benefits accrued to the diligent through sheer grinding hard work. It is living, breathing, walking, and talking, only we cannot see it because it is happening too slowly. The rock isn't even aware of our existence, because we are only alive for but a brief instant of its lifespan. To it, we are like flashes in the dark. Hey, what's up, bookworms and wannabe scientists? Mike back here to talk about the first book in the great Michael Crichton reread. And this is, of course, the 1969 science fiction classic, The Andromeda Strain, a book that I feel like everyone has at least heard that name before. And even if they had no idea that it was Michael Crichton, have no idea what the story is about, I feel like they've heard the term The Andromeda Strain, especially with what's going on around the world now. And everybody likes to try to compare these things. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But this is the first entry in what is going to be a year and a half project on the channel. I'm calling it the great Michael Crichton reread for a lot of folks who are joining me on this. It's their first read and a lot of people on the Discord decided to jump on board and read The Andromeda Strain and the uh, the reception has been rather warm. A lot of people, this is their first uh, venture into anything Michael Crichton or their first book other than Jurassic Park. So uh, lots of interesting feedback on it and we're going to kind of talk about that as we go through it here. But uh, he wrote this book when he was 27 years old on the side while he was getting his MD at Harvard University. Yes, this is the kind of things that he did in his spare time. And you know, even though he uh, did get his medical doctorate, he never actually studied medicine. He used that big brain of his to write these awesome stories. And I wanna kinda talk about not only that, but uh, how this was my first novel that I ever read that was science fiction based. I'd only read fantasy and just your standard, you know, kid stuff. Reading this as a preteen kind of really opened my mind, that whole idea of a, a virus that can wipe out, you know, mankind if, uh, if things get out of control, if it's not contained. So I feel like this was even before like The Stand or anything like that. This was my first exposure to, uh, to this uh, subgenre, I guess you call it. And uh, it's, it's, it's one that's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of, you look back at it now, and I'm sure it's not the first, you know, contagion can wipe out the planet kind of story out there. It's the first one that I ever read. And uh, I mean, even on the front of the book, it says the story that shook a generation. So you think when this came out, this probably scared the pants off a lot of people in the 60s. So, I mean, gotta look at it for uh, its historical significance as much as, uh, you know, my experience with uh, with this genre. So uh, lots of fond memories there. So I was curious if it would see how it would feel on a revisit, if I'd feel the same way as I did as a kid. Cause I'm reading it this time, I was like, I don't know how I understood a lot of the stuff when you know I was like 11, but you know, before I get started, I'm gonna say elephant in the room, uh, you're gonna get lots of comparisons with this, with uh, the virus that shall not be named. Stop it, it's not the same. Uh, I got this a lot when I did the stand. I got this a lot when I talked about Edgar Allan Poe's, um, the, uh, the, the Mask of the Red Death. Look, the Mask of the Red Death, uh, within 30 minutes, people were basically shitting blood and their insides out and dying. 100% of people that it came into contact with. Not the same. The Stand, 99.6% of the world's population were wiped out by Captain Trips. Not the same. Then you have the Andromeda Strain, anyone that it comes into contact with, except maybe a select few, and that's the mystery of this novel. Within three seconds, they drop dead. 
that is not anything like the virus shall not be named. Now, I know that this is something that's obviously current. It's on people's minds, so they're going to want to quickly go there, but it's not quite the same. So uh, I, I don't like it when people compare that because I don't think it's the same. It's a shitty situation. It sucks. I'm definitely not saying anything like that, but like uh, Captain Trips and the Andromeda Strain, nothing like the, uh, the the virus that shall not be named. So I was going to get that out there now because I know a lot of people are going to want to bring that up. But go ahead, guys. Let's do uh, like we always do. Let's talk about what is the book about the United States government is given a warning by the preeminent biophysicists in the country. Current sterilization procedures applied to returning space probes may be inadequate to guarantee uncontaminated re-entry to the atmosphere. Two years later, 17 satellites are sent out into outer fringes of space to collect organisms and dust for study. One of them falls back to Earth, landing in a desolate area of Arizona. 12 miles from the landing site in the town of Piedmont, a shocking discovery is made. The streets are littered with dead bodies from the town's inhabitants, as if they dropped dead in their tracks. A group of top scientists are hurriedly assembled in a bid to identify and contain what should be a very lethal contagion. And guys, that leads into the 1969's The Andromeda Strain. Nothing uh, that might feel original to you at this point in life as we've had a billion stories like this since. But again, like I said, I don't think that this was a very, very popular subgenre in science fiction at the time. So that's why I like to give it some credit that it deserves here. But that's like we always do, guys, again, what makes it good or bad. First off, uh, the big thing with Michael Crichton novels is the science. He was very, very much about writing his stories based off of scientific fact or scientific theory. Stuff that he felt like was either very easily provable or stuff that feels like it could be happening tomorrow. That's what made his his science stuff so good. It was based off of fact or theory that was backed up by a lot of facts. And this is no different. Uh, his, his forte really as a writer was to take these really heavy science themes and give them to the reader in a way that was approachable. You know, you didn't have to have a, a PhD in science or physics to figure out what he was talking about. He was able to put it into simple layman's terms that everyone could understand. And that's no different here because, look, in this book, he talks about amino acids. He talks about enzymes. He talks about, uh, you know, the, the, the number of proteins in DNA and things like that. He talks about what the body does when it, can t when it absorbs ethanol. What happens to your body? It converts it to formaldehyde. And these are things that you feel like, I'm not actually bored reading this. I feel like I'm reading a science project and I'm not actually bored. It's it's very much like the uh, what I said about Mountains of Madness by, by Lovecraft was like, there are times where it feels like this is a very basic science report, but you're not bored reading it at all. And, and I think this even more so than the Mountains of Madness where you feel like, okay, I'm never not riveted with these ideas that he is presenting. And that, again, that is something you will see through this whole read along is that Crichton was always able to put the science out there and never bore you to tears with it. Yeah, Mr. White. Yes, science. And the thing about it that does the best is that it was easily backed up because I found myself Googling some of this stuff afterwards. Like, okay, you know, this is 50 plus years old now. Surely some of this stuff isn't right. And I was like, I'll be damned. A lot of this stuff is actually very scientifically accurate. And, and again, you think, okay, well, I, we've known about, you know, amino acids and stuff like that for, for you know, 100 years. Uh, I, I didn't know this. You know, I don't know. Well, I, I'm not a scientist, guys. I, I didn't go into, I don't know the history of amino acids, you know? But again, being able to go back and being like, oh, well, you know, maybe some of this stuff is outdated. No, I'll be damned. It's not. It's almost like Michael Crichton did his homework first. So that's a, something I think is really, really interesting. And then, uh, I, some other things that I I actually felt like I was learning about when I read this this time is um, I knew the very basics about epilepsy. I had no idea about some of the things that could trigger it, and that basically it's something that you can you know keep hidden. I, I didn't know this. I thought it was just something that was like unavoidable. When it's going to happen, it's going to happen. I I didn't know these things. I had no idea. I am completely ignorant on how epilepsy works. You know, I basically, all I knew about epilepsy, epilepsy, besides how to say it, is uh, when I would play a video game sometimes, it'd be like, hey, you know, this can cause epileptic seizures or something like that if you're not careful. And again, it's really just guessing on my behalf. So uh, I felt like I, I learned a little bit about that. And again, like I said, I, looked, I researched some of this stuff after I read it just to see how that actually correlates to what if, you know, how much of this is, is indulgement, uh, you know, how much is uh, embellished a little bit. But no, it's actually a lot of the stuff that he has in here is like, this is scientifically proven stuff. And again, that's, that's really great. And then they had this thing in this book called the odd man hypothesis. 
I was just enamored with this idea because this is something I've actually brought up before just in weird conversations with people about how someone who doesn't have a spouse or children thinks so much differently than someone who does. And they present this idea in this book and it is just absolutely compelling to me. And it's one of those things you would think, okay, maybe this person would make a different kind of a decision than this person you know, who isn't, doesn't have real world attachments, but it's like a huge variance between it with, with when you actually look at the numbers. And it's just, it's just one of those kind of things I never really would have thought too much about. And it's it, the way he presents it in the book is, is really well done, and it's proven, right? So uh, that always makes it really great. So uh, I, I would very, very much like to, uh, it's like the kind of thing that if Mr. Crichton was still with us, I would love to hear a lecture on this, because <laughs> I think that he could put it in a way that'd be like, wow, that's really, really a neat idea. And uh, it's one of those things that when you start talking about human emotion, you can't say, okay, that's scientifically proven, because obviously human emotion, everyone's is gonna kind of be kind of different. But you know, when you're working off of numbers and variances and things like that, the way he presents it, you're like, I can see that. Another thing that I really like in here is, is Crichton gets a lot of crap for saying that his characters aren't really, uh, you can't really differentiate them. I really like the team in this one. I felt like they were all different enough. Uh, I mean, it was Dr. Stone was a very interesting character, but I think Dr. Hall was the one that I resonated with the most. And I feel like the reader kind of resonates with him because he's not only... I mean, he's not, he's not even the best in his field at what they've recruited him for. They recruited him because he is the odd man. You know, he is the unmarried, no kids guy here. So he's not even the smartest one. I kind of feel like that every once in a while, they kind of flex their elitist muscles on, you know, we're the, we're the smartest and the brightest in the country, you know, and you were just the, the smartest that didn't have kids, you know. It was one of those things where you kind of feel like yourself, you're in his corner the whole book because you almost feel like they are alienating him just a little bit when it's like, yeah, guys, we're all on the same side here, you know. You know, we're trying to save humanity. You know, we ain't got time for this, you know, junior high, you can't sit at our lunch table kind of attitude. So you kind of find yourself in his corner a little bit. I really, really love the wrinkle with Dr. Levitt. That was something I didn't expect. And uh, like I said, I learned a lot based off of that character. So uh, yeah, I felt like all of them were differentiated enough that uh, I appreciated them. I really, uh, I, I like the little bits of backstory that you get through uh, letters and things like that. The way that he writes it, it, it never ever feels like it's taking you out of the here and now with this story. And that was very, very important to me. But uh, yeah, I, I like the whole team and uh, I could have used a little bit more of them, honestly, because this book is really like 250 pages. It's really not that long, but it's one of those things like, yeah, I, I wouldn't have mind having a little bit more about this team because I liked them all. One of the best things about this, I think, is the finale. It is the ultimate race against the clock, hold your breath, biting your nails kind of thing. You think, okay, I don't know very much about Michael Crichton. I don't know what kind of author he is. I don't know how dark his endings are, you know? So you don't really know necessarily that all these people are going to make it here. So it's a, it's a really, really tense ending. And I really, it's one of those things like you can kind of hear the countdown in your head while it's going on. It's, it's, it's really, really good stuff. Really, really tense action. And really is like, you can see the beginnings of what he would eventually make this uh, subgenre called the techno thriller. You could kind of see it right there in those pages. But uh, there are a couple of bad things I kind of want to talk about here, guys. While I said it was good, now this is going to be kind of subjective. This is going to kind of depend on you. I think if this you're a first time Crichton reader, the uh, the science might read like you're reading a science report. She blinded me with science. That might be a little rough for you, especially if all you've done is like fantasy and then you come to Michael Crichton, it might be like, uh, this is a lot of numbers and information that I wasn't expecting. The good thing is, it's like, you don't have to understand it. You don't have to be doing like, it's like I said when I reviewed The Martian, uh, once you just let the math go and you believe, okay, he can handle the math. I'm just going to trust that he's the, uh, he's the scientist here. He knows the math and you're not trying to understand the math you'll be fine. Uh, I, I think that's the same here. Uh, you can, like I said, the, the odd man hypothesis, you can look at those numbers and just see, okay, that's a huge variance. That makes a lot of sense. But you're not going to be doing equations or nothing while you write this. But I feel like some people will be a little stunned by that when they first start and be like, I, this, is, this is a lot of numbers and a lot of science. I'm feeling kind of bogged down. But again, you don't have to read all that and absorb it and understand it really. The middle section of this book, and it's a very long portion, is really just about them getting uh, clearance to get lower and lower and lower into this facility. So it's a lot of waiting, making sure that everything's clean, there's no bacteria, things like that. That might not be the most compelling read to people. To me, it's like all the things that you wouldn't think 
are dirty about the human body, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, I thought it was, it was fine. Even I did think it went kind of long though, you know, but again, uh, Crichton was a very detail oriented author. So he was never going to skip any of these things and be like, okay. And then they just went through all the security clearance. He's going to tell you about the security clearance. So uh, again, for first time Crichton readers, that might be a, a little tough for you, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's not awful, but it's not exactly riveting to read, seeing all these clearances. And then there's the resolution at the ending. Uh, I, I did see a lot of people on Discourse this, and I kind of thought it myself too, is it, it is quick. It is very, very quick. And I think that this is something that Crichton really does. You know, he'll provide his resolution, and he doesn't really linger. He doesn't stick around. There is no Lord of the Rings ending here. Uh, he'll get the resolution, and you're either satisfied with it or you're not, and then... And credits you know that's just how his books kind of worked he didn't really hang around afterwards and let you see a lot of the aftermath and uh, this is a very very prime example of that some people might not like the resolution again based off of science you know he's always going to do that over the drama that's just the type of writer that he was so uh, it might not thrill everyone uh, i thought it was fine uh, i kind there's like the whole thing where you're trying to figure out the link between this old man and this baby you're trying to figure out what the link is between them and it might not be completely satisfying to you but again like i said science let's get into why you should read it guys i really feel like this book was the precursor to something like the stand or swan song something this the whole end of the world ideas and you know I feel like this really just kind of scratches the surface of that, but it was definitely influential to some of those authors. I mean, King is a very well-known Michael Crichton fan, so I don't imagine he didn't read this book before he read the before he wrote The Stand, things like that. Uh, but uh, I also feel like it's something that if you're looking to be challenged a little bit, I said you don't have to understand really the science to get too far into this, but it doesn't hurt. It'll really make some things make a lot more sense to you. So if you feel like challenging that brain of yours, uh, this is definitely the type. He's the type of writer that's going to do that more than once. Like I remember a lot of people uh, in, in Jurassic Park when they read that, they all of a sudden they had no interest in DNA strands before they read that book. Uh, but, but this, you know, I, I think that uh, you're going to challenge your, your brain a little bit. But I also think this is a quick, easy introduction to the world of Michael Crichton. Because again, like I said, 250 pages, it's not a hard read. I don't feel like it's ever like sloggy or anything. If anything, it feels kind of rushed at times. So uh, a very, very easy introduction into his world if you don't want to start with one of his heavier books like, like a Congo or a Jurassic Park or something like that. This is a very good first step, I think, for people. I, I think that uh, you could see that uh, he, he had something special, but he, again, this is not uh, indicative of the rest of his, his, his bibliography here. Uh, he grows quite a bit as a writer, and if this is his first offering, and it's this good, uh, I think you see why I became such a big fan of the man's work. A uh, couple of final thoughts here. Look, being over 50 years old, I thought that this book was going to age out a little bit. But I'll be damned if it isn't still relevant. And again, like I said earlier, I feel like the science, a lot of it still is really easily backed up with just a simple Google search. It really is. So uh, something you'll hear me say a lot during this uh, read along is that the man was ahead of his time, is ahead of the curve on a lot of these things. And uh, like I said, what I loved about his stories is he always presented science that we hadn't achieved yet and always made it feel like it could happen tomorrow. Or like Stephen King once said, maybe today. That's kind of how his books always felt with me. So the fact that he based so much stuff on undeniable facts, and that's what's made his books age so well. This is a great great example of that because like i said finding myself googling a lot of these scientific ideas and just being like yep yep that's accurate um i don't know if stephen king was actually influenced by this that's a guess on my part i know someone will call me out on that oh that wasn't an influence for the stand at all that's just a guess on my part like i said i know that stephen king was a fan of michael Crichton. i don't imagine anyone from his generation did not read the andromeda strain because it was very very popular i don't think people understand how popular that book was and then that movie two years later which we'll talk about in a minute uh but uh yeah this just scratches the surface of what the techno thriller would become i still put this one under just straight science fiction but again starting uh up next with the terminal man i think you see he starts getting really into that whole sci-fi techno thriller thing that he came so famous for now we're going to talk a little bit about adaptations because i don't think there's very many authors that have had their work adapted as often as michael crichton 
And while I can't make this quite like Into the Multiverse with Stephen King, uh, his world isn't a connected universe, so I can't really do that. Like I said, I think he mentions Engine in another one of his books, but that's about it. But uh, what I'm going to do with Michael Crichton stuff is I'm going to talk about the book, and then I'm going to talk about the adaptations. And if I think that you should check them out or you should avoid them, because more often than not, they'll probably be a void. But uh, let's go ahead and talk about the adaptations for this 1971 film by Robert Wise very very faithful to the source material like i was actually blown away how faithful it was i watched it right after i finished the book like the same night i think this might be the most faithful michael Crichton adaptation ever i mean it's literally like almost page for page at times very little changes dr levitt's a woman instead of a, a man in the book in the movie and that doesn't change anything in fact i actually kind of like that quite a bit uh because uh she is a feisty feisty woman <laughs> and she played the part really really well I changed her name to Ruth in that but a uh, very very good uh, adaptation it's going to be dated guys it's a 50 year old movie uh, it's done in the 70s so you know some of the graphics are going to be hilarious to you and things like that but I think the fact that it is so simple is something that makes it uh, age really well. You know, they didn't try to do anything that was so far ahead of their time that they couldn't. But uh, it, it's uh, one of those things where I just, I really felt like it was so faithful to the, to the source material that it was might be one of the best adaptations of his works ever. It's actually amazing to me. I, I didn't think that they could do this with Michael Crichton movies. Now, the movie can seem a bit slow and drawn out at times. It is two hours and 10 minutes. Like I said, that whole middle section, uh, he, they do all that in the movie. They do not shy away from any of the uh, the, the getting into wildfire parts. So it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a little slow maybe to some people. So if you're needing like a big shoot em up or whatever, if you've read the book, you know this isn't that type of book. You know, it is a very science-based book. So the movie follows that to a T. But I love some of the cinematography and the choices they made in that, like the uh, the split screen, like um, one of them will be like looking in a window when they're first in Piedmont. They're looking in a window, and then there's like a separate window showing what they see. Uh, something they did in the Warriors, I think, and it was really really neat for the time. I really really like those additions. But uh, uh, I, this is a definite recommend that you watch after you read the book, because uh, I think that you'll be like, hey, cool, that's not how I imagined, it, but it's a really neat idea or something like that, or hey, that's just how I pictured it. So a definite recommend. Let's talk about the. 2008 miniseries on A&E. This was right before he died. And I remember this was very exciting for me. And here's the thing is, I recorded this on my TiVo at the time. And I hadn't watched it yet. And I just left it on there for a while. And then he passed away. And I felt so sick that I couldn't watch it. <laughs> and I, I so I didn't actually watch this until like late 2009 or something like that. And then I was just angry and wished that I hadn't watched it. This is just a dreadful, dreadful adaptation uh, this is more in line with how Crichton adaptations usually go, as in like it makes you scream out loud, did you read the fucking book? You know, that's really how Crichton adaptations usually go. And this is every bit, I think it, even they even use the words of it's a reimagining, which means that they just wanted to get away with not being faithful to the source material. They tried to make it an action flick. Uh, the acting is absolutely dreadful. I can't believe Ridley Scott put his name on this. None of the actors look like they want to be there. It looks so low budget. It looks like... Uh, early 90s sci-fi channel bad. It's just, it's a awful. It's one of the worst Crichton adaptations. It's not quite Congo, but not much is, you know, but uh, yeah, it's just absolutely terrible. Like I said, they tried to make it feel action-packed, and it just felt forced, and they couldn't even get, like, names right. They couldn't even use, like, some of the same names, and it's just like, what is the logic behind changing that character's name? Makes no sense. So, it was very clear from Go that they just wanted to make a scary virus movie. And so many things that the virus does in that movie, the virus doesn't do in this book. So again, it's just a big miss. This one is an absolute avoid. Uh, I don't even think that there's any like campy redeem. Like you can watch Congo and be like, this is so bad that it's just laughable. And you can watch it and just laugh the whole time at how dreadful it is. This is just like painful. There's nothing redeeming about this. So yes, absolutely. Uh, I know I said it's not as bad of an adaptation as Congo, but uh, it, it's it's less watchable than Congo, if that makes any sense. And there's, it's like six hours long. So no, yes, avoid at all costs. And guys, that is the Andromeda Stream of Michael Crichton, a book I think has aged rather wonderfully. Uh, we're going to be doing the Terminal Man in March. And those guys, you guys who love uh, Black Mirror 
on Netflix, I think that you will love The Terminal Man. It'll be right in your wheelhouse if you're into things like that. Uh, I won't spoil anything for you. I just think that you will enjoy it quite a bit. Much different than the Andromeda Strain. You know, there's a little bit of a gap between Andromeda Strain and Terminal Man because he decided to go make movies instead. You ever heard of Westworld? Yeah, he did that movie between those two books. So, uh, yeah, the guy was in demand and he was a... Uh, he was very, very busy in Hollywood at the time. But guys, did you read Andromeda Strain? What did you think? Drop in the comments and uh, let me know.